Hey everybody, it's Lon Seidman. One of my favorite mini PCs of all time is the GMK Tech G3. It has been featured a number of times here on the channel. And you're not seeing double here. I actually bought a new one because they just came out with a plus version of the G3 that has Intel's latest low-end processor, the N150. So I bought this the other day to see how it compares to the old one and whether or not you should upgrade. And so we're going to put this one through its paces in just a second. And it looks familiar, but it's different. And I do want to let you know in the interest of full disclosure that I did pay for this with my own funds. The other one was sent to the channel free of charge by GMK Tech. No one has reviewed or approved what you're about to see before it was uploaded. Nobody is paying for this review, and all the opinions you're about to hear are my own. So let's get into it now and see what the G3 Plus is all about. Now, the price point on this is still quite low, $159 as configured. There is a coupon button that you need to click when you are shopping for this on Amazon. Additionally, they have a bare bones version available on their website directly. But the one on Amazon, which is what this one is, comes equipped with 16 gigabytes of RAM, just like the Mac Mini does now, and 512 gigabytes of NVMe storage. It also has a fully licensed copy of Windows 11 Pro on board too. It is very upgradable. You can just pop the top off of it, very similar to what we saw on the original version of this computer. And just like the regular G3, there are two storage slots here. You have an NVMe slot for uh, your NVMe storage. It will come with that slot occupied by the storage that yours comes with. And then there will be an open slot here, which I have filled with this M.2 SATA drive. Now, their uh, compatibility here on the second slot is only for M.2 SATA. So you do need a SATA drive and not an NVMe for this second slot. The 2282 is the one that's compatible here, and that's what I've got in there. And what I'm doing with this computer, just like I was doing on the old one, is dual booting Windows and Linux. So this is my Windows drive, and this is my Linux drive, and I can boot up whatever operating system I want uh, just by selecting the drive at boot. And then over here we have our RAM slot. As you can see, it's very easy to swap that RAM out. This has got a 16 gig module, which is the max apparently for this platform. And it is DDR4-3200 RAM. So it could run a little faster if it had DDR5, but I think for what most people are going to do with this PC, it's not that big of a deal. So pretty easy to get in there. Just snap the lid back on and you're good to go. The port configuration is also identical to the old one. So we have our two HDMI outputs here. These will do 4K60 each, so you can have two distinct displays going at once. You also have two USB 3 ports here on the back, along with another two here on the front. There is no USB-C, just like the original, it lacks that. You also have 2.5 gigabit Ethernet here, which I tested a little bit earlier, and it was able to achieve the speeds I would expect out of this port in both directions. So you can see we got 2.3 on the downstream there. And if I jump over to the upload speed, you can see we also got 2.3. The Wi-Fi doesn't perform as well. This was the similar issue we saw on the original. So the downstream on the Wi-Fi was coming in at about 375 megabits per second. And we were getting about a half a gigabit on the upstream. This is a Wi-Fi 6 radio, a Realtek one. It's a Realtek 8852BE, and it's similar performance to what I see on other inexpensive mini PCs. So the Wi-Fi is not as good as it could be, but the Ethernet is running quite well. And by the way, the Ethernet is an Intel i226V. Now, as far as power is concerned, you've got your barrel connector here. It comes with a 36-watt power supply. It runs at 12 volts. So that gives you a few more power options. If you wanted to try to run it off a battery or something, just get that a barrel connector adapted to your power source and you're good to go. So lots of flexibility there. As far as power consumption is concerned, when I put it under heavy load, it was doing about 30 to 32 watts. And then under idle conditions in Linux, it was doing about 12 to 14 watts. So pretty low on the power consumption and very well suited for home lab environments, especially if the server will be sitting idle for a while. All right, so I've got it fired up right now. We've got Windows loaded up here. And just like before, we get our Windows 11 Pro that is fully activated. And it appears to be relatively legit here. And I did run all of my usual malware checks on this and didn't see anything wrong with it. Uh, you can, of course, wipe it clean and install your own version of Windows or Linux if you want to do that. 
The first thing I wanted to take a look at was Microsoft Word. We are running this at 4K60. It feels very snappy and responsive. I can't say that it feels any faster than the old one does. This processor has a little bit more oomph in it. Basically, the difference between the N150 and the N100 is clock speed, both for its CPU and GPU. But I don't think that clock speed boost is enough that most people will notice the difference. So if you were finding the older version, the G3, at a reasonable price, it's probably going to deliver similar performance to what you're going to see me do over the next five minutes or so. I am going to jump over to the web browser here and visit the nasa.gov homepage. Again, we are at 4K60. You can see how fast everything is rendering in, including having this animation on page right when we uh, load up. We can go into some other articles here and you can get a feel for how all this stuff is rendering in. Uh, so altogether, for a basic computing device, this is going to feel and perform quite nicely. They even give you a visa mount so you can mount it on the back of a monitor. A little bit earlier, I ran my 4K 60 frames per second video test. Had a couple of drop frames when it first started and then it settled down. I did see one or two other drop frames as the video was playing back, but nothing out of the ordinary. I did have a dialog box that had popped up and that might have triggered a frame drop or two. Uh, but by and large, this performs pretty much as nicely as the other version does at video decoding along with encoding. And if you're using this as a Plex server, as we've talked about before, these Intel N100 and now N150 chips are very well suited for that purpose. And you can check out my full video about that capability. And on the browserbench.org speedometer benchmark test, we got a score of 10.9, which is the exact same score we got with the regular G3. So as you heard a minute ago, qualitatively, this felt very similar to the old one. It didn't feel all that much faster. And quantitatively, at least for web browsing, we got a result that kind of backs up what I was feeling. Again, a little bit of a performance boost here, but not one that is all that noticeable. But I did run some games on this earlier, and we first loaded up GTA 5. This ran actually pretty well on the old one, and here it runs just a little bit better. So this is at the lowest settings at 720p, and it was able to generally hold 30 frames per second or higher. It didn't dip down below like 25 most of the time. So GTA 5, which in fairness is an older game, uh, did run quite smoothly on here as it did on the old one, but a little smoother uh, with this new processor. I also did some retro game emulation. We loaded up a PS2 emulator. This is running at the native resolution of the PS2. We didn't apply any fancy effects to the uh, emulation here, and it was able to run this game at full speed uh, with just a couple of little lag hits here or there, but I attribute that to reading off of a USB disc. And this is pretty much the same performance that I felt on the original. But we've got another benchmark to take a look at, which is the 3D Mark Time Spy benchmark test. And on that benchmark test, we got a score of 450 on the new N150 processor compared to 369 on the N100. And although that is like a 22% increase in performance, at least insofar as the benchmark score is concerned, when you're at the low end of the market here, those big jumps in performance don't mean all that much because it doesn't translate into a huge uptick in overall game performance. So as you can see there, the frame rates are not much different between the two devices here, although it is measurably faster than what we saw before. Of note though, the N97 processor, which is from the prior generation chips, is running faster still, just barely. So I'm eager to see what Intel does with that part of the lineup. And what was really confusing to me last year was that the N97 is faster than the N100, and now it's roughly in line with the N150. So I'm curious to see what Intel might do at that part of the market segment. We'll probably find out at CES this year. But altogether here, as you can see, it doesn't seem like it's a huge boost here, at least one that you can notice, even though we are measuring an uptick. And on the 3D Mark stress test, we got a score of 96.7%. That compares to 98% on the original G3 with the N100. Now those scores are very close, but I do think we're seeing the difference here with the higher clock speed on this new chip. They didn't change the hardware design here at all. So I think we might just be seeing this chip running a little bit hotter and perhaps throttling just a tiny bit uh, when it's under heavy sustained load. However, the fan noise on this new device 
is much, much lower than it is on the original. So the original device, you could hear that fan going, especially when you put it under load, it would ramp up and down. This one is practically silent, even when the system is under load. In fact, I had to put this up to my ear to make sure that it was running. So it's a very quiet machine, much quieter than the original, and that might be a good enough reason for some folks to pick this one up over the original G3. The fan is much improved on it. All right, one last thing to take a look at, of course, and that is its Linux performance. I did install the latest version of Ubuntu on here and everything was detected and operated without issue. So we got the display working at 4K60 with all the scaling options enabled, audio, Wi-Fi, Ethernet, Bluetooth, all of the components were detected and started working without issue. And you'll also find that Linux will probably run a little better on this machine, partly because the operating system is just more efficient than Windows is at this point, especially given that there's not a lot of consumer stuff like advertising that they throw at you uh, beyond what you might see on a YouTube channel, for example. Um, so it is a very nice Linux experience, as was the old version of this. And I found this machine to be a great alternative to a Raspberry Pi, because if you look at the Pi 5 and factor in the cost of the power supply, a case, a fan, the keyboard and the mouse and all the other stuff, you're into a price point that is very close, if not more in some cases, than one of these things might cost you. And of course the uh, computer is much more powerful than you would get with a Pi 5. So this has been my go-to machine for home lab experiments, for Plex serving experiments, for doing general Windows tasks. It's just very, very versatile and inexpensive enough that you could probably buy a whole cluster of them and start messing around with some of those things as well. You can run a whole data center off just a couple hundred watts in your uh, basement or something. So it's a very useful machine. The fact that you have such fast ethernet on there also helps as well. And although my updates are currently running on Windows, I can show you in a little bit uh, just how easy it is to dual boot from one operating system to the other. So once this update is done, we'll take a look at that and we'll close out. So Windows finally finished up doing its updates here. And on my system now, because I installed Ubuntu on the second drive, what it also installed is this Grub bootloader. So I can pick what operating system I want to run uh, when I boot the system up. And if I don't do anything, it defaults to Ubuntu here. And what's nice about this is that I don't have to push any buttons at boot to get to this screen. It will come up all the time. So I can do Windows, I can do Linux, I can run some memory tests. You've got everything you need right here without a lot of complexity. And it's been great to see over the years just how easy Linux has become. And I think if you have not played with Linux, picking up one of these cheap computers is a fun way to get started. You have very little risk of destroying the hardware and you can learn a new operating system and new skills for not a lot of money yet get a lot of performance at your fingertips here. So the big question is, is it worth upgrading from a G3 to a G3 Plus? I say probably not. We didn't notice much of a difference in any of the things that we were doing with this thing. However, we did measure a slight difference as you saw on those benchmarks but I don't think there's a big enough performance difference here to justify getting rid of your old one to get a new one. That said, if you were looking to buy an additional one or one from uh, the beginning here, I think this one is probably worth getting just because it is the newer version. The fan is a lot quieter, which I think will be a big selling point for a lot of folks and all in a very affordable PC that does a lot. It really punches above its weight. That's gonna do it for this one. Until next time, this is Lon Seidman. Thanks for watching.